Hello, welcome to the 12th lecture of EP1027, which is Maxwell's Equations and Electromagnetic Waves. This lecture was actually due on Friday. However, I was late and I'm putting it out today. Um, the agenda for this is very short. I'm going to talk about resonant cavity and guided EM waves. So this will um, end up the uh, treatment of EM waves. In the next class onwards, we will look at... Um, fields and um, radiation pattern of point charges and of um, um, system of point charges such as uh, antenna and etc. so on. So today's class will uh, conclude our discussion of EM waves. It's going to be a short lecture, maybe half an hour, something like that. So the references for um, this chapter is, uh, um, this lecture is of course again chapter 9 of Griffiths which is a very meaty chapter and uh, essential for reading. So uh, let's look at about, uh, let's talk about uh, resonant EM waves. So these are analogous, um, so we're going to talk about EM resonant cavity and these are analogous to organ pipes uh, which you've learned about in high school. In organ pipes you have, um, which is actually an empty container and you excite some kind of sound waves inside. These are sonic or acoustic resonant cavities. What happens is that the air column inside is excited by some uh, tuning fork or some other um, other source, and then there's longitudinal pressure and density oscillations of the air column inside that organ pipe uh, creates standing waves, standing sound waves. It, if it so happens that the sound wave uh, frequency of the sound wave um, usually is equal to the tuning fork frequency. But if it matches one of the uh, characteristic frequencies of the um, resonant cavity or the organ pipe, then you produce um, um, resonant, uh, you know, e sound wave with large amplitude. Okay. Otherwise, if it's not a resonant mode, then of course you have standing waves, but the amplitude is not that large. If it coincides with the uh, char some characteristic frequency determined by the geometry of the organ pipe, then you have standing waves with large amplitude. Now, similar phenomena occurs uh, when you have electromagnetic waves instead of sound waves. And uh, the resonant cavity or the um, counterpart to organ pipes is, is a closed container made up of conducting walls. Now, such a closed container, which is made up of conducting walls, acts like a resonant cavity for EM waves. You can have standing EM waves inside, and then you can also have certain resonant frequencies for which the EM wave has a very large amplitude. So the EM wave excitations can be stimulated inside um, by an antenna or an emitter of EM wave. This we will learn about in the next lecture. And um, we can achieve resonant or large, by resonant uh, EM waves, I mean actually large amplitude EM waves, standing waves inside the uh, conducting uh, container. If the conducting walls are perfect, that is the conductivity is infinite, the waves will last forever, the standing waves will last forever. However, realistically, we don't have perfect conductor, instead we have ohmic conductors. As you know, most of you know, ohmic conductors need constant energy um, to drive the current. And that is because um, the energy required to drive the current is converted into heat, which are known as ohmic losses. So the waves will dissipate, so a lot of the wave energy will go into the heating of the conducting walls and the waves will uh, disappear for after a while, okay? So um, let's look at uh, how to set up this thing, theoretically treat this thing. So we solve for E and B field, which is oscillating in a cavity, okay? So this is a bit more complicated than this analogous problem for sound waves, because unlike sound waves, which is the pressure wave, uh, which is a scalar quantity, these are vector fields. And not only are the vector fields, but the E and B field equations are coupled through Maxwell's equations. And of course, E and B have their own individual boundary conditions, which we have talked about um, in detail in the last few lectures. So uh, the first assumption we're going to make is that the cavity is empty. And this conduction, this assumption is easy to relax. We can relax it to a cavity filled with a dielectric. Um, this goes through uh, without much of, a, uh, much of a difference. And also, we will later on study in a coaxial cable briefly, very briefly, I'll touch upon this in which, uh, of course, the, the, the solution we will obtain will be different. But for the time being, we are going to study an empty cavity or a hollow container. Now, um, we have to solve for the Maxwell equations without any sources because it's an empty cavity. There are no sources. So the electric charge, which is the source of the divergence of the Gauss law, 
that is zero as well as the there's a current inside the cavity most of you know by now these equations uh, lead to wave equations for E and B you can take curl of last two equations and then you can show that these two equations turn into a wave equation for the electric and magnetic fields right by now most of you are um, used to this now and we will because we want to consider oscillating electric and magnetic fields inside we're going to um, in order to solve this we're going to um, put an answer like this so the entire spatial amplitude has been separated from the time time varying part so the space varying part and the time varying part have been separated out so just to ease the solution come for and then the wave equation we can plug the solution in the wave equation here so e to the i omega t will give you del del t square will become minus omega square so you get a uh, equation like this so this equation when with some operator acting on e gives you some number times e this is something which is known an eigenvalue problem As, um, and in particular uh, the e of x is eigenvector of this operator the laplace operator with an eigenvalue minus omega square over c square the same thing holds for the b field the magnetic flux density the it is also this vector is also an eigenvector of the laplace operator with an eigenvalue something like this uh, i i hope most of you are familiar with the eigenvalue problem either in your course in linear algebra or matrices so our job is to solve the eigenvalue problem subject to some boundary conditions okay um, however the wave equation is not everything we know that the six maxwell equations we have um, are much more than just the wave equation so the in particular the faraday law and the ampere law or ampere maxwell law these relate the components of e and b so they are coupled in a way so not all six components of e and b are independent because they're related to simplify life we will assume cylindrical cavities and waveguides from now on cylindrical cavities most of you know there is the direction what i mean by cylindrical there is the direction um, let's say the z direction uh, along which um, there is some kind of translation invariance if it is finite then it will be a cavity if that axial direction is infinite then we have a guided wave or a waveguide okay so what are the boundary conditions as i said we have to solve this subject to some boundary conditions so what are the boundary conditions because it's a conducting surface we are already acquainted with the familiar phenomena of uh, skin depth and skin effect right so inside um, a conductor electric electromagnetic wave cannot uh, persist oscillating electric and magnetic fields cannot persist uh, a continuity of, of the uh, parallel component of the electric field parallel to the conducting walls but outside and inside but the inside as i said due to skin uh, skin effect there is no oscillating field inside so this is zero and same holds for the magnetic field continuity equation we have gauss law which gives us continuity of the magnetic field but magnetic field outside the wall and inside the wall this will be equal outside the wall it is non zero but inside again due to skin effect or skin depth we cannot have um any oscillating field inside the conductor so that is zero okay so i'm assuming these are perfectly conducting walls okay and it doesn't have to be perfectly conducting actually when you have a ohmic conductor most of you know that the skin depth is finite it is proportional to 1 over sigma or 1 over square root of sigma so i'm taking this case in ideal case when sigma is infinite then that's case 1 over square root of sigma is just zero okay in this approximation and there you might wonder what about the other two boundary conditions which is the continuity of or sorry the discontinuity of the d field and the discontinuity of the h field um, in this case um, what happens is that these are not two independent boundary condition so this sigma and k are the induced charge and the induced current uh, on the walls of the cavity or the conducting surface of the cavity now these are not external data what happens is that these conditions are satisfied and whatever these are the surface charge induced charge will adjust itself so that this um, this equations these two pa this pair of equations are satisfied okay so sigma and k the sorry little it should be big k not little k vector so the induced charge density and induced current density surface current density in the conducting walls will adjust themselves to satisfy these two conditions so these two do not 
give any independent boundary condition. The only boundary condition we need to worry about for a resonant cavity are these two. Okay. So, um, as I said, that we consider cylindrical cavities in which we have axial symmetry or cylindrical symmetry along something. So, as you can see, the shape is invariant as we go up. The shape of the cavity is invariant as we go up. Okay. A cylinder of arbitrary cross-section doesn't have to be a circular cross-section. The cross-section can be something arbitrary, something like this, which you have, uh, which you have depicted in the figure. So, for uh, this kind of um, um, geometry, we will further narrow down our ansatz. We just had vector e times e to the i omega t, but because of this cylindrical symmetry, we will assume that we can uh, split it up into the z dependence can be split up into this kind of a uh, sort of a wave solution which is propagating along the z direction. I'm sorry, there's a double z. It should be a single g. Please ignore it. So uh, you might wonder why, why are you, why am I assuming there is a wave propagating around this direction? Actually, the reason, and the thing is that I am not assuming there's, it's a wave propagating. It turns out that the exponential function is a basis for any kind of function, which is translation invariant, um, on, on translation invariant direction. So this is something which is known as Fourier's theorem. Hopefully, you've learned about this in your mathematical methods class. That any, um, if you have translation symmetry, any function. Uh, uh, in that direction can be written as a sort of a superposition of exponential or plane waves. Okay, so uh, that is what I'm using. Though I'm not assuming that this is a plane wave going, but uh, yeah, I'm using a plane wave basis to write down an arbitrary function. So an arbitrary function would be a sum over all, all k, but then we can analyze, we do the superposition principle, we can analyze for individual k and then add up the full result. Okay, so don't assume that I'm using a monochromatic wave or anything. It's just a basis for an arbitrary function. So we will take this kind of an ansatz and then we will sum over all possible k's. Okay? So this is the cylindrical ansatz. And then we plug it in Maxwell equations. In particular, which Maxwell equations? We will, in particular, we will solve um, Faraday's law. Sorry, um, Ampere Maxwell law and Faraday's law. We will plug these two ansatz here. And these two equations, this kind of ugly equations, which you have seen, I've written down in all gory detail, perhaps they uh, give you no insight, but um, still, just to see what these equations look like in component form, this is what they look like. And every time there is a spatial a z derivative, I pull down a factor of k. Oh, sorry. Every time there's a z derivative, I'll have to pull down a factor of plus minus i k. And every time there's a t derivative, I have to pull down a factor of minus i omega k. Okay. So this is, for example, this equation. So this is the x component of both sides. So x component will be del y b z minus uh, del z b y. But then the del z I have to write as e to the because of this uh, kind of exponential function I can just replace the del z by plus minus i k. Okay. This is what I've done. And then uh, del del t I can replace by minus i omega, which is what I've done. And then the c squared there for the right. So similarly, you can do for all all the six equations, and you have these equations. Um, so what you will observe is that these are linear, simultaneous linear equations in e x, b y, and e y and b x. Right? Um, just skip these two equations. These two equations the, for the timing. Just forget about the um, third and the sixth equation. If you look at these four equations, they're simultaneous equations and four variables. So the which can be solved. So the four variables are ex, ey, and bx, by in terms of ez and bz. Okay. So um, most of you know that these six equations are not independent because the curl, components of the curl of a vector field are not independent. From the two components of the curl, you can construct the third component and so on. Okay. So, for example, uh, by taking further derivatives, you can show this equation is already contained in these two equations plus the Gauss law. So, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, for the time being, ignore the second, third, and sixth equation and solve the first, uh, first two and the fourth and fifth equation uh, for these quantities. And the solution would look something like that. For, for instance, ex, I can solve in terms of ez and bz. In fact, the derivatives. And then I can do the similar thing for the EY, BX, and BY. Okay, so the, this is the list of solution. So what I've done is that uh, whenever I have IK plus minus IK, I've just reverted back to the Z derivative because it looks nicer. Okay. 
So EZ and BZ, everything else, EX, UI, BX, and BY get determined in terms of EZ and BZ. So e, if we know EZ and BZ, they determine everything. So this is the algorithm which we are going to follow whenever we encounter with the resonant cavity for EM waves. We're first going to solve, if, uh, I mean, particular cylindrical. So we will uh, solve for the transverse EX and BX, or transverse component, in terms of the longitudinal, which is along the axis. The Z direction is the cylinder direction. So once we know the axial components, everything else gets determined in terms of the axial component. So um, the entire thing rests on solving the longitudinal components. Once we are done solved, once we are done solving these, um, these will get automatically determined, easy and busy. So which equations govern easy and busy? We don't have to go back to Maxwell equation. In fact, we already have the eigenvalue equation, right? We have the eigenvalue equation, so this will have taken the z component of the eigenvalue equation. So we have this eigenvalue equation. Now for a cylindrical cavity, I'm taking just the z component or the axial component of the eigenvalue equation. So this eigenvalue equation we will solve, okay? Now uh, I'm fully aware that we didn't cover uh, partial differential equations uh, solutions, so I'm not going to actually go through the how to solve this. If you're interested in knowing how, how this is solved, this is done in Griffith chapter 9. You can see it's not very difficult. You just employ a trick which is known as separation of variables. Okay, But I don't have time to go through that. For that, we need a separate course or a longer course in electrodynamics. For this timing, I will just write down the solution to this equation. Okay, so But before I go, one thing I want to point out is that if z is the transit direction, um, sorry, longitudinal direction, then we cannot have both EZ and BZ to be zero. Okay, EZ and BZ, uh, both of them are, are not zero. If they are zero, then EX, EY, BX, BY will all, this formula tells you that they are all zero. Okay, so that is not possible. So, um, in cavity oscillations, they are not transverse. You have to have one of the, either EZ or BZ non-zero. Um, so th remember these are the axial or the long longitudinal components. So they cannot simultaneously value vanish for no waves at all. Now I would, this is an important caveat that this only happens when you have a hollow cavity. Now, as Griffiths points out, if you have a coaxial cable in which uh, you have another source inside, then of course uh, this equation, this, this conclusion is incorrect and you can have uh, transverse um, uh, transverse oscillation in which E and B, Z, both components are zero. So let's, uh, we ha but here, in case of a hollow cavity, we have right there of the two choices, two following choices. We can have E, Z, zero. So there is no longitudinal component of the electric um, field. So the, along the axis, there is no electric field. Only components are um, X and Y direction. But in this case, we have to assume that B, Z is not zero. The mag magnetic field would have some component along the longitude axial direction. So these waves appropriately titled as transverse electric waves because the longitudinal component is zero, so the EM waves are entirely transverse. So not EM wave, the, the E wave, the electric field, is entirely transverse. Or you can have the other choice in which EZ is turned off, so uh, sorry, EZ is non-zero, but the magnetic field is transverse. So because the magnetic field is transverse, its longitudinal component vanishes, these are called TM waves, appropriately called TM waves. So this is a summary of um, what we need to do. Let's consider the T wave, the transverse electric wave. Because it's transverse, the longitudinal component of the axial component is zero. Um, but the magnetic field um, longitudinal component is not zero. So the first equation, this is identically zero because EC is zero <coughs> for TE waves. This equation survives, so we have to actually solve this equation. This is the eigenvalue equation we need to solve. And this we have to solve subject to the boundary condition for, uh, for B that the perpendicular component of B at the surface vanishes. Okay. Um, this uh, boundary condition you will need to solve this equation. Similarly, for the TM wave, we have EZ non-vanishing but BZ vanishing. So because this is non-vanishing, we will have the eigenvalue problem or equation for this to solve. And this has to be solved with the boundary, appropriate boundary condition for the electric field, which is the parallel component of the electric field at the surface should vanish. Okay, so I, as I said, I won't go through all the details uh, 
um, because we, we actually need to solve a Poisson equation. This is, as you can see, this is a Poisson equation. The so Poisson equation, when you, uh, in fact, this is known as Helmholtz equation. Um, and you need a whole bag of tricks to solve these equations, which is not complicated, but uh, we just don't have the time to um, do that. So we will skip it. Uh, suffice for you, it will suffice to know what the equation is and what is the boundary condition. And then uh, hopefully in some later course, you will learn how to solve this in detail. So the general mode of oscillation is, of course, you can have, the this is not a general situation where you're considering special cases. In the general case, both of them can be non-zero. So this is neither T nor T, Tm. So uh, the general case is neither of them are zero. In that case, however, we can still split up the problem into, because we can superpose, we will split up the electric field into uh, two electric fields and the magnetic field into two electric magnetic fields, one along the axis and one along the perpendicular to the axis. The one uh, along the axis um, will correspond to the solution and they were perpendicular to access the solution. And then we, at the end of the day, we will add the solution because Maxwell's equations are linear equations and you can superpose two, uh, two equations uh, to give you the same, uh, to give you a new solution. So um, the general case doesn't need, need to be considered independently. You just resolve into the two, these two cases and then add the final answers together, okay? Now, one particular special case is a rectangular cavity. Here we had a cylindrical cavity of some, uh, the transverse section was not cylindrical, uh, not rectangular. The transverse section was some arbitrary shape. Uh, further analysis can be done <coughs> if you take a rectangular cavity. And this is the one I was saying, which has in Griffith, you have to use separation of variables to solve this. Uh, the solution to the eigenvalue equation and everything else, uh, eigenvalue equation is this, so the z component has been worked out. So the z component, of course, depends on x, y, and z, all three coordinates, and the dependence, uh, dependence of that is given by these, um, and you can check that indeed the, uh, for example, z direction is parallel to the, uh, parallel to the uh, surface. So at the surface, when x equal to so let me just, uh, I forgot to mention this, a rectangular cross-section with sides A and B, and D is the depth, uh, which is the cylinder direction, the axis of the cylinder. A, the cross-section is made of, is, is a rectangle with sides A and B. And this is the solution. You can explicitly check this, although you cannot derive it right now, maybe, but you can actually plug this in the eigenvalue equation and check that indeed this is a solution. Um, with the boundary condition. So this is a TM uh, mode. So this is a TM mode, not a TE mode, because EZ is non-zero, but, uh, but BZ is zero. So for this TM mode, uh, you can check explicitly that when it goes to the boundary, which is x equal to uh, x equal to A or x equal to zero, this is zero. So indeed, the parallel component of uh, the Z component, which is parallel to the surface, indeed it is zero at the boundaries. And similarly, at the y boundaries, boundaries in the y direction, you can check this function has zeros when y equal to zero or y equal to b, right? So indeed, it satisfies the boundary conditions as well as it solves the eigenvalue equation. You can plug this in. It solves the eigenvalue equation provided there is some relation between these integers m n appearing in this and k with the omega, the frequency. Okay, so remember this frequency, which is the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is given by this in terms of the integers appearing in the solution. The eigenvalue is this. So this is the solution to the eigenvalue equation with eigenvector given by this and eigenvalue given by that. So um, uh, so this mn would be an integer. For example, it could be 1, 0. m could be 1, n could be 0. Oh, sorry, no, n equal to 0 is not there. n equal to 0 is excluded because then there is no mode. Right, n equal to zero, the solution is a sign, sign of a zero something is identically vanishing. So this uh, solution will go away. So m and n cannot be zero. It is all integer except uh, not zero. So it could be, uh, also it cannot be in negative quantities because m sine minus m pi x is linearly dependent on sine plus m pi x. So these are only positive integers. And k is of course continuous. k has no quantization considered. Uh, condition unless we consider a cavity of fixed depth okay then we have to uh, consider a boundary condition that is the parallel component of e vanishing 
at these two uh, surfaces as well in that case uh, k gets quantized as well okay k gets quantized as well and it is given by k um, l pi over d so this is a very symmetric looking formula as you can see c is the speed of light by the way so this omega is there i've just transferred it here so now the wave is given by three integers the t tb mode tm mo mode is given by omega lmn through these three are positive integers and you can have one two three something like that or one 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 or one my one two one something like that okay so these are uh, these frequencies these are the resonant frequencies i was talking about these are the resonant frequencies which you can which can sustain large amplitude standing waves em waves inside the cavity the geometry fixes it completely so this is given by this formula um, so this is the resonant cavity of finite depth uh, suffice to say that d is the largest otherwise we could have considered x to be the axis if the x was the largest direction we could have considered oh sorry x could be the if it was the largest direction we would have considered x to be the axis however we are considering a cav long cavity in which d is much larger than a and b okay otherwise there's no point of calling it uh, d the z to be the axis um Wave. These are resonant cavities. These were resonant cavities, but we we also consider waveguides in which these are infinitely long. So uh, actually, they're not infinitely long. They're just much much larger than D is much much larger than A and B to the point that you can take uh, it to be continuous. So in that case, um, I would replace this by just the k square. Okay. So omega k l m n. So for this this formula is appropriate for cavities of finite depth. And this upper formula is applicable for um, waveguides in which k is a continuous. It's not an integer. It's not a, it does, it's not um, a discrete, but it's a continuous number. It can be anything. And the velocity you can compute, which is phase velocity, you can compute is omega over k. It will turn out to be greater than one. Um, if I divide everything by k, so this quantity, which is the sum of one plus two positive integers, and this is clearly greater than c, right? This because c times a number which is more than one, so this is clearly greater than c. So this might um, appear to you that there is something paradoxical going on here because um, we we know that in special relativity tells you that nothing can fa travel faster than the speed of light. How come is it that the phase velocity? is more than the speed of light and the answer is that the phase velocity is not um, when you have dispersive waves phase velocity you can see that the velocity depends on k so this is the dispersive um, this is a dispersion relation because the velocity of the phase with omega phase for a wave with omega frequency omega and wave vector k depends on the wave vector k oh, i'm sorry wave number k so in this case, uh, the actual physical uh, energy or some physical information um, proceeds with this velocity, which is known as the groove velocity, which is given by d omega over dk. And this is given by this, uh, when you take a derivative of this omega with respect to k, you get something like that. Now this square root quantity has shifted to the denominator. So we have c divided by a denominator which is greater than 1, which means that the overall velocity is less than the speed of light. So then we are fine. Um, then we are fine because uh, this is less than the speed of light and this is consistent with special relativity. Now Griffith explains why it is less than c. What happens is that if you have um, a, EM, a resonant EM wave, what happens is that the EM wave is a standing wave which is getting reflected over and over from the sides of the cavity. And so it never really is traveling along the axis, but it is getting reflected from the walls and the overall mo movement is along the axis. So it's the velocity along the axis is only going to be the component of the velocity along that axis. Okay, because the whole wave is moving in some arbitrary oblique to the axis, oblique direction to the axis. It gets reflected from the up wall and then gets reflected back down, so on and so forth. And there's some overall motion along the axis. So that motion is um, the velocity of that would be the component of velocity of the wave along that axis direction and which is of course going to be less than c. Um, we can also consider coaxial cables. 
in this case the boundary value conditions uh, the eigenvalue problem gets a bit more uh, interesting in the sense we can have both transverse electric and magnetic fields now I'm going to not going to do it in detail but Griffiths um, explains this nicely in section 9.5.3 why this happens so what uh, I'm going to just uh, give you a sketchy re reason why that happens is that if we look back at our equations now which we have both BZ and EZ to be zero so these equations for example this equation if um, BZ is zero will give you curl of E vanishing and then of course you have Gauss law which is del X EX plus del Y EY equals zero because EZ vanishes so you have del X EY minus del Y EX zero and del X EY plus sorry del X EX plus um, uh, del y equal ey equals zero so these two equations are curl vanishing and gradient vanish and divergence vanishing in two dimensions so just in two dimensional space there's no third dimension now it turns out most of you know if curl of something vanishes it's going to be written as a um, gradient of a potential and then if divergence vanishes it means gradient uh, divergence of the gradient vanishes which is laplacian of the potential vanishes now that laplacian of a potential vanishing we know the properties of a Laplace equation in which um, if you have a Laplace equation we know a Laplace equation has no local maxima or minima so the maximum or minima would lie at the walls of the container and then inside it will be uh, um, it cannot be either more or less than the uh, container so in fact the only solution is when if it's completely equipotential if the ho hollow cavity is equipotential which means electric field is zero so TEM that's why TEM modes cannot exist for uh, hollow containers but if you uh, a new twist is added, added if you introduce a second conductor for example a coaxial cable, cable in which you have two um, concentric um, cylindrical uh, wires um, then you don't have you have two boundaries technically speaking so uh, and those two boundaries um, can have different values of potential and the potential can be less than or more than the surfaces okay because uh, for example it could be intermediate between the potential and somewhere in the middle of the two coaxial cables could be um, the mean value of on the outer surface and on the, in, in, uh, on the outer surface of the outer cable and the outer uh, surface of the inner cable right the potential will be some a mean of these two so it doesn't have to be equal to either of these two and hence the electric field which is the gradient of the potential will be non-vanishing that's why it is fine we can sustain T modes when we have coaxial cables if what I explained right now is not is too fast or if it's not too clear please read uh, section 9.5.3 of Griffiths he beautifully explains what happens and in that situation what we have basically is um, electrostatics and magnetostatics in two space dimensions instead of three and for that you can use just simply Gauss law which you have learned for cylindrical symmetry you can use Gauss law to arrive at the expression for the electric and magnetic fields most of you know um, in two dimension instead of an inverse square law you have an inverse uh, just an inverse law so E 1 over the inverse distance from the axis and B is also 1 over the inver inverse distance however the electric field is entirely radial while most of you know Biot-Seward law tells you that the electric field has to be azimuthal uh, magnetic field has to be azimuthal but the dependence how it falls off from the uh, from the axis is given by one over the axial distance okay this is an artifact of uh, two dimensions instead of three because effectively speaking we have uh, because nothing changes along the third direction the axial direction effectively that um, and we have transverse and electric field the electric and magnetic fields do not have component and direction effectively we have removed that um, third direction from our consideration and we are left with two dimensional so that equation is easy to solve okay so I think we are at the end um, uh, this is something we had a little bit left over for from this from the for the um, on the topic of EM waves so hopefully most of you are now happy that it is complete and um, I have a couple of announcements first is that um, next two classes or next one lecture maybe uh, we will consider the radiation emitted by a point charge which is going to be important and then we're going to look at the radiation emitted by a system of charges for example an antenna in which which is specified by a current density okay 
So um, these patterns of radiation are important. Um, and I have another announcement, which is that the quiz four, which was supposed to be uh, today at 7 a.m., is now postponed to Wednesday, May 6th at 1.30 p.m., okay, in the afternoon. And this is because I wanted to include the material on resonant and guided EM waves in this quiz because uh, this is a quiz on EM waves, and if we, if we leave out resonant uh, or guided EM wave, that is not good. So hopefully you'll have a couple of days to uh, look over this chapter in Griffiths or, uh, you know, and compare with what I've uh, said in the class and, and uh, you know, get a nice feel for this. And then we'll uh, take the quiz on Wednesday at 1.30 p.m., okay? Um, so we'll next, next time when we meet, I'll talk about radiation emitted by point charges. We'll learn about Leonard, we should potential, and Jeff Mako's equations. And then uh, we'll have uh, various emitters, half wave, antenna, and so on and so forth. And then we'll see the pattern of the radiation emitted by those charges. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you.